This sermon series is part of the special season at Redeemer that we are calling Rise. During this season, we are hoping to accelerate a movement of the gospel for the good of all of New York City. Our vision is to see the body of Christ in the city triple in the next decade. To that end, each sermon in this series will focus on one of Redeemer's gospel-based core values. If you would like to go deeper with the passage this sermon was preached from, we have created daily Rise devotionals available at redeemer.com slash rise daily. A reading from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 6 through 26. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, and we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The word of the Lord. So each week we're taking a look at one part of Redeemer's vision, what what has animated us throughout our history and what will animate us in the future. And tonight we're taking a look at uh, one of the the most, the deepest convictions uh, of our congregation, of our church over the years, and it's this, that the gospel is not just the minimum Christian doctrine required to believe in order to go to heaven when you die. That's one way of looking at it. The gospel is sort of the minimum Christian doctrine you have to believe in order to go to heaven when you die. A Redeemer, we have always taught, because the Bible teaches, that the gospel changes your life now and it changes every part of your life. And it changes you from the top to the bottom, from the inside out. And w- what the whole ministry is about is essentially to unfold how the gospel changes absolutely every part of your life. And it's a huge subject, obviously, if it's really what Redeemer is all about. But what we're going to do with this great story, this great compelling story of Jesus meeting a woman at the well in Samaria, is I'm just going to give you the highlights, the top highlights of it, and urge you just to sort of bask in the greatness of it so that you're motivated to find out more, like, how does this actually happen in my life? It's a great story. Uh, you know, in, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, there's a place on the Schuylkill River 
Uh, there's a Kelly Drive goes along the east side of the Schuylkill River, and on the on the one side of Kelly Drive, right against the water, is Boathouse Row. In the very middle of Boathouse Row, right across the street from the boathouses, is a 12-foot statue of a, uh, a pilgrim. Big guy, you know, carrying a big Bible. It's huge. <laughs> kind of intimidating. And right, right behind there is a path that goes up Sedgley Hill toward what's called Brewery Town, a part of, the, part of Philadelphia. And on the way up, you, you, at a certain point, you get to a, uh, a fountain, or a spring, really. It's a spring, and years and years ago, uh, the city of Philadelphia built a kind of cistern around it and, and uh, you know, an archway over it, and they put an inscription over the spring, over the spring. You know what it says? The inscription is this. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. It's uh, John chapter 4, verse 13, and it's making a point, and it's what Jesus is saying here. Look, here's what Jesus is teaching us about gospel change in this passage. First of all, the breadth of gospel change. Gosp Jesus Christ's life-giving change goes to everyone. We all know, right, probably, that the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. There was racial animosity. We know this was a patriarchal culture in which men did not speak to women in public if they didn't know them. We also know, all the commentators will tell you, that this woman came to the well at six, at noon, the sixth hour, at noon. And uh, women did not go to draw water for the day's chores at noon. They went to draw water early in the day so they could do the day's chores all day. And they did it in the cool of the day, not noon when it was hot. And the fact that she was coming alone and she was coming at noon was a testimony to what you learn later on, and that is she was a social and moral outcast. But Jesus Christ, as it were, reaches right through every barrier, right through the racial barrier, right through the gender barrier, right through the social barrier, even through the moral barrier, and engages her with a thoughtful, thoroughgoing conversation about her whole life. Jesus is embodying the gospel, because the gospel, according to Jesus in verse 10, is about the gift of God. Oh, he says in verse 10, you see this? If you knew the gift of God, if Jesus' life-changing power, if the gospel-changing power was something you attained to, if it was something that you, uh, you, 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 you earned, as it were, I mean, throughout history, whenever people, whenever anyone has said, here's how you change your life, almost always is, this is what you have to do. You have to pull yourself together. You have to summons up your strength. And if it's true that gospel change came through self-discipline and summonsing up your strength, well, then it would privilege the people who had the strength to summons up. And it would privilege people who uh, had the, the, the self-discipline, who had the training in that case, of course, the people further up those ladders, up the racial ladder maybe, the gender ladder, ladder the, the moral ladder, the social ladder, the people who were uh, you know, more able and more talented and, and more self-disciplined, they would have a privilege, uh, an advantage over other people. But oh, not if gospel change is a gift, because if it's a gift, well, grace is egalitarian. If it's a gift, then anybody can receive it. It can come to anyone, and that's what Jesus is. Jesus is embodying the gospel by reaching out across all those barriers. You know, see, in verse 10, she's shocked. You're a, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, you're a man, I'm a woman, and I'm a Samaritan woman, I'm, and I'm not necessarily a woman with the greatest uh, reputation. How could you be engaging me? And, of course, he's basically embodying the gospel. Because, see, the gospel is egalitarian. It goes to everyone. In fact, if anything, frankly... Uh, it's not only true that since, the gospel, since, since Jesus' life-changing power is a gift, therefore people up those various ladders of accomplishment don't have any advantage of anything, people at the bottom of those ladders may have a little bit of an advantage, because why? Well, how can you fail to get a wage by not working? But how can you fail to receive a gift only through pride, only through saying, I don't need that, I can do it myself? And therefore, the people higher up the ladder are actually less likely to receive the gift, more likely to have the pride that keeps them from ever getting the gift. So Jesus Christ's life-changing power, his, the gospel change, belongs to everyone, especially the weak. And by the way, 
Jesus Christ embodies the gospel by going out and not privileging people higher up on all those social ladders. And if you understand the gospel, you won't privilege those people either. Secondly, the second thing we learn here actually is about the process, the fact that gospel change comes gradually. Do you see how patient Jesus is with her? Uh, we, we don't have time to actually uh, trace it all out, but you know, when, when in, in verse 15, you know, he's talking to her about living water. We'll get to that in a second. And she says, okay, if you've got living water, give me the living water. That's verse 15. And he comes back and says to her, go call your husband and come back. Now, we'll explain why he says that in a minute as well. But the point is, she says, I have no husband. Well, in, in that society, the only respectable way, the only way that a woman who is an adult could be without a husband in respectable societies if she was a widow. The fact, of course, is she wasn't a widow. In fact, she was, uh, she had, was living with a man and she'd had five husbands, which is, was unheard of in that kind of moral hierarchical society. And therefore, she's essentially lying here. She's essentially, at least she's deceiving. And because well, she doesn't want to talk about it. So she asks him a question. He gets personal. I don't want to get personal. She says, uh, oh, I uh, see you're a prophet because you know that I've had five husbands and I'm living with a man. So if that's the case, she says in verse 19 and 20, our ancestors were worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Which is it? There was a, there was a religious and political controversy at the time. The Jews had a temple in Jerusalem. They said, that's where you connect to God. The Samaritans had a temple right there. That's where you connect to God. And she says, Okay, which is it? Let's, let's talk about this. See, again, she doesn't want to get personal. So she's trying to deflect. But he, as I'll show you in a minute too, he comes right on back and says, okay, you want to talk about temples? Let me talk to you about temples. I'm making them all obsolete. And then he goes back and says, I'm the one you need. So over and over and over again, she's trying to deflect. He's trying to come back. She's trying to deflect. She's trying to come back. Jesus is patient with us. Psalm 73, this is a believer speaking. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you, yet I am always with you, for you hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into glory. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And what the psalmist is saying there, now the psalmist is a believer. This woman at this point is not yet a believer. But it doesn't matter. Change is gradual. God is patient with you. You see, Psalm 73 said, I was really embittered and I was doing this or that, but I realized you were with me all along. You were holding my hand all along. You were leading me and guiding me all along. Gospel change is gradual. God is patient. It doesn't happen like that. It's not a crisis. It doesn't happen overnight. And why? Well, it's because it's because gospel change is not mechanical. It's organic. How fast can I grow a pile of bricks? The answer is very fast. Just give me a big truck. You know, you could, you know a pile of bricks can grow very fast. Why? Because a pile of bricks is essentially growing mechanically, you know, just throw bricks on it. But how fast do you grow a tree? Well, you can't grow a tree like that. Why? Because the growth of a tree is organic. It's internal. It's a growth in vitality, growth in complexity. See? And gospel change is more like the tree. It's really not like the bricks. And as a result, you've got to understand that gospel change is for everyone, but it's gradual. So first, it's for everybody because it's a gift. It's grace. Secondly, it's gradual. Thirdly, it's powerful. Jesus says, I've come to give you living water. Living water. Now, in, um, everybody says that, I mean, there's some difference of opinion, but the human body is supposedly at least 50% water, and that's why we crave water like no other substance. If we are uh, getting thirsty... It, it's uncomfortable. If we are really deprived of water, it's agony. And if we are incredibly thirsty and water deprived, and, that for the, and, and, and water hits your mouth, it is so sweet. It is so satisfying. Now, what is the living water? 
It's obviously not a physical thing. What Jesus is saying is this. I have got something that your soul needs as profoundly as your body needs water. I've got something that is as satisfying to your soul as water is to a parched mouth. What is it? Well, it's, it's eternal life. And eternal life is, through the Spirit's power, the assurance and the experience of God's love and pardon and presence and grace. Now, some years ago, I heard a, I heard a talk on why real pervasive change has to happen through God's grace, not through willpower. Why? Because obviously sometimes you can say, I need a change. Well, how do you change? Well, you, you, you bring in a technique. You bring in a discipline. You bring in a rule, and I'm going to f- abide by that rule. And by the way, change can happen that way. But you see, when, you, when a, a law or a rule comes into your life, it comes in in spite of your desires. But when the living water of Jesus Christ comes in, when an experience of the love and the presence of pardon and the grace of Jesus Christ comes in, it satisfies your deepest desires. You please the lawgiver because you have to, but you please Jesus the grace giver because you want to. And I remember years ago, the talk was this. If you've actually experienced the grace of God in your life, it's like water in a parched mouth. If you are really thirsty, and you get some water, you cannot possibly take just one sip. Can you imagine? Imagine just literally dying of thirst, and you have some water, and you just take one sip. You couldn't do it. You couldn't. You're just going to throw yourself in the water, or you're going to do this to you. or what? And in the same way, when you actually begin to taste the, the grace of God, it changes your life pervasively and sweepingly because it's sweet. Grace grows through your heart because it's sweet. The law, a mechanical thing, a technique, a discipline, a rule, just can never change your life like the grace. That's how powerful it is. So gospel change is for everyone because by grace, it's a process. It's, a, you know, it's gradual. It's also, of course, a power. But here's the other thing. It goes all the way down to the bottom of your heart. Historically... When you read books on change your life, I mean, there's so many things that say change your life. My word. In the cab on the way down, I was uh, looking at my notes, and suddenly I heard say, help a child change change a child's life. And I'm like, wait, change a child's life? What is it? And it was, it was, uh, it had to do with getting kids to read. I mean, it, it's interesting that right now everybody's talking about uh, how to change your life, and this will change your life, and this is life-changing. Well, historically, there's two base, basically been two ways that the world has told you this will change your life. The ancient way is to summons up the mind and the reason and let it uh, control the passions, and therefore you change through willpower. It's mind and reason over passions, and you change with willpower. Nowadays, today, what actually happens today is more and more, it's almost the opposite. Today, modern people say, here's how you change your life. You look at your emotions, and you see your strongest desires and feelings, and you express those strongest feelings and desires, and that way you become your authentic self. So ancient people said you change yourself by stifling your feelings and doing the right thing through willpower. Modern people say, no, 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 you express those feelings and you, you, uh, and you, uh, uh, you realize those dreams in order to become your true self. <clears throat> but I would suggest to you that both of those are not gospel, the way gospel changed because both of them are technically superficial. Why? Because one goes to the will, one goes to the emotions, but neither of them actually affects the heart. How so? Notice that Jesus Christ... When she says, okay, give me the living water, says, go get your husband. And that looks like a completely uh, kind of insensitive, inexplicable non sequitur. It just doesn't seem to follow. She says, I want to, you know, I want your living water. She says, well, go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, yes, I know. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. What's he doing? Is he changing the subject? No, he's not. He's not changing the subject. Here's what he's saying. He's saying to her, 
if you want to understand what I'm talking about, if you want to understand what this living water is, which is the deepest, most profound soul satisfaction, you need to realize that you are already trying to find it. You're already digging wells to look for it. You're doing it in men. You're doing it in men. And if you try to find the deep soul satisfaction that only I can offer, if you try to find it in any other created thing, in any other object in the world, whether it's in money or status or career, whether it's in romance or, or children or marriage or, or sex or, or pleasure, no matter what, if you try to find our, my soul satisfaction that only I can give you anywhere else, you will thirst again. It'll be husband after husband after husband, man after man after man, career after career after career, more money, more money, more money, and you'll always be thirsty. And you'll always be enslaved. Why? Because all the things that you look for, look at all the things that, in which you look for what I can give you only, they'll make you earn it. They'll make you earn it. And it'll never be enough, but I'm the only source of living water and the only source of soul satisfaction that won't make you earn it. It's a gift of grace. And here's what's going on. If, for example, you struggle to change uh, because, let's say, you're, you work too much, or let's just say you do need men or women. Maybe you do need romance too much, so you find yourself getting into all these relationships you can't break up. They're bad relationships. Your friends say, why don't you break up? I can't, I can't. In other words, if you have, a prob you have problems and you want to change, well, you can do the ancient way or the modern way. The ancient way is to just try to stifle yourself, just clamp down by act of the will, say, I won't work too much, but guess what? That'll work for a while, but eventually, unless you change your heart, unless your heart stops looking for the living water in that place, you'll be back to it. Or you can say, well, the modern way is you just look in your, your, your emotions and you say, what's my strongest emotions? But your emotions are, don't forget, she was following her emotions. Your emotions fix themselves on things that can never satisfy. And so you don't just go to the will and you don't just go to the emotions. You say, how can I restructure the very, the very, uh, uh, the very order of my heart. How do I change my heart so that it, it fixes on things that were really it ought to fix on? How do I ever get true rest? How do I ever get true satisfaction? And Jesus says, only through me. Now, how does that happen? That's what we need to do. We need to go all the way to the heart. But how does that happen? And the answer is in what he finally says to her at the end. You know, He's, a, he's, a, he's just remarkable, Jesus is, because every time she tries to throw him a curve and say, okay, let's just talk about which temple is the right temple. That was a political and a theological issue. And it seems like it's a kind of an abstract issue. She was saying, let's talk about me. Let's talk about which of these temples is the right one. Look what he says. He says, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Thus far, you know what he's actually saying? It's pretty interesting. He says, if you're asking right now which of these two temples is the right temple, it's the one in Jerusalem. This is not a real temple. That's the real temple. But, he says, yet, but. A time is coming. And by the way, the translation, it says, a time is coming. But the word Jesus uses in the original Greek is, the hour is coming. Yet the hour is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now, no, everywhere in the Bible where Jesus, excuse me, pardon me, everywhere in the book of John where Jesus uses the word hour, every single place, he says, my hour or the hour, he's always talking about the cross. He's always talking about the hour of his death. Do you know what he's saying? He says, yeah, right now there's a temple in Jerusalem. There's a temple here. That's the place for the sacrifices and where the priests are operating according to the will of God. That's the real temple. But I'm about to die. My hour has come. And when that happens, you won't need temples anymore. You'll be able to worship him anywhere. See, right now in the temple in Jerusalem, 
That's where these sacrifices are being made to atone for sin. But they're actually appointing to me. And when I die on the cross, I'm the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. I'll be the priest to end all priests. I'll be the temple to end all temples. You won't need a bridge between God and humanity anymore. And how is he going to do that? Because on the cross, he will cry out, I thirst. How can he give this woman, who's not living the most morally exemplary life, is she? How can he offer her the most radical, wonderful thing in the world, the living water, absolute soul satisfaction, which will restructure her very heart and change her life completely so she's not driven in, by anything else. She'll be liberated. How can he do that for her? Because on the cross, he said, I thirst. You say, well, of course he was thirsty. He was dying. It was crucifixion. It was terrible. There was more going on than just the physical thirst there. Because Jesus Christ cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was experiencing cosmic thirst. He was being cut off from the real source of joy, his father. He was experiencing the burning sensation, the incredible, devastating heat of the wrath and justice of divinity. He was getting the divine justice that we should get. He was burning up. Why? He thirsted. He got the cosmic thirst so we could get the water of life. And see, it's not just to know the water of life is the, gives you the joy. You have to see what it cost him to give it to us, and that will change your heart. That will change your heart. When she gets that, she will not need men the way she did. You won't need men or women the way you do. You won't need money. Money be, just becomes money. Men just become men. Women just become women. Romance becomes a good thing, but not the most important thing. You're free. Do you know what the power of a changed life is? Do you know how radical it is, how radically your, your life can change? If you don't see religion and morality as the way you change your life and effort, but you see the grace of God that comes in, electrifies you, and changes the very basis of your self-image, your identity, of your, the, very, the very foundations of your heart, Recently, I reread a book called Shan Tung Compound. Shan Tung Compound. It was written by Langdon Gilkey. Langdon Gilkey graduated from Harvard in 1940 and went to China to teach at a, to English at a university and was captured when the Japanese overran that part of China, and he was put with all other Westerners in an internment camp. It was a terrible place. 2,000 people crammed into less than a city block. Uh, it, it, uh, it, was a, it was a dangerous place. It was a difficult place. It was, there were armed guards all around. It was, a, it was a prison camp. Now, Langdon Gilkey tells the story in his book. And when he got there, he said, I was a secular person. He said, well, religion's fine for people, but I actually think probably that it's, uh, if you like it, that's fine. But you don't need religion to live a good life. To build a good life or build a good society. Human beings are re reasonable. They have a sense of fairness. They can use science and technology and build a good world. You don't need religion. And the entire uh, experience, he was there for a couple of years, uh, they were all together, really disillusioned him and knocked him out of his secularity because he saw how everybody, both educated and uneducated, religious, there were lots of missionaries and, and priests there, by the way, and unreligious people, were, when, when they were when they realized their survival was at stake, how cruel they became, how selfish they became, they refused to share, they refused to reach out to each other, they began to steal from each other. He was shocked, and he began to realize that human beings are sinful, that they actually don't have a sense of fairness, not when their survival's at stake, and they will not reach out to each other, and they just do everything they possibly can to, to do for themselves. This radical self-centeredness, this radical selfishness completely changed him, and he began to realize, wait a minute, wait a minute, people are sinful. They're not what I thought they would be. But here's what's interesting. If you read the book, you say, oh, so he got religious. Well, yes, eventually he did. He did find Christianity. But when he was there, he began to say, well, okay, the secular approach to things is not enough because people are selfish and they're, and they're evil, 
and, we, and, and they need something. But religion doesn't fix it. Because he noticed that the religious people, especially the missionaries and the priests, were every bit as selfish and cruel as everyone else, except they used all kinds of fun, fine religious and moral language to justify it. In some ways, he said they were worse. But there was one man in the camp that stuck out. One man that he actually said, in spite of the fact that everybody else was disillusioning him, Langdon Gilkey said, this man, he says, uh, it is rare indeed when a person has the good fortune to meet a saint, but this man came as close to anyone I've ever known to be a saint. His name was Eric Little. Uh, he had uh, run and won a gold medal, 400, in Paris in 1924. He was a uh, Presbyterian missionary. He was a uh, very strong Christian missionary, and most of the other missionaries were not very impressive to Langdon Gilkey, but this guy was different. He said he, had, he said he had an overflowing good humor. Everybody struggled with anger and selfishness and pride, including Langdon Gilkey. Gilkey says we all struggled with, with despair and selfish behavior, but this man was different. He was over, over, overflowing with good humor. He always had, was filled with love of life, and he was constantly pouring himself out in an effort to help all the teenagers the teenagers in that camp were really, you, you talk about at risk. They were really, he, they were penned up, they were frustrated, and what he did was he was constantly, he, he, he did square dances for them, he did chess tournaments for them, he made, helped them make model boats, he cooked modest meals for them, and Gilkey said we would scarcely have survived if it wasn't for this man, Eric Little. But he, he actually had a brain tumor and died of it at the camp just before liberation. But here's the thing, why was he different? Why were so many other religious people like everyone else? And this is what Gilkey wrote. He says, religion is not the place where the problem of man's egotism is automatically solved. Rather, it is there that the ultimate battle between human pride and God's grace takes place. Human pride may win that battle, and then religion can and does become one instrument of human sin. Hear that? You can get into religion and just make it one more way to be selfish, say, be self-righteous, to say, look at me and look at you. Look how much better I am. But, he says, if there is a confrontation of the self with God's grace and the self does meet God in his grace and so surrenders to something beyond its self-interest, then Christian faith may prove to be the thing that the human race needs, release from its self-concern. Here's a man who wasn't just religious, he wasn't just moral, he understood gospel change. You be like him. You become a person who's that changed. And you'll become someone that not only saves everyone else in the internment camp, but it's basically what the world needs too. Just be gospel change. It's what the world needs. And it's the way to satisfaction and joy. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for giving us uh, a time that we could talk about how gospel changes our lives. Lord, some of us in this room have yet not yet grasped the gospel and don't have that life-changing power in their lives, but all the rest of us who maybe have grasped the gospel, we are not using it as we should, because look at us. Look at us. We're not what we should be. Make us what we should be. Through the power of the gospel, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's sermon. Please join us in praying for gospel renewal, both where you live and in New York City.